Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the purpose and characteristics of an embedded system. You should also be able to identify devices in which they are commonly used. Now, we've been looking at the CPU and we've been looking at the various different components and parts of a CPU. However, a microprocessor on its own can't operate. It needs to be a part of something. And computers aren't generally laptops or desktops or supercomputers. They are small enough nowadays to be fitted into all sorts of different types of devices from smart TVs to fridges to speakers, you name it. These small computer systems are known as embedded systems and they're designed for specific tasks. So we're going to be looking at these today. So let's start by a formal definition. An embedded system is a combination of hardware and software which is designed to carry out a specific set of functions. A computer, in the traditional sense, is not an embedded system. So never say a laptop is an embedded system. It's not. A laptop might have multiple embedded systems in there, but a laptop itself isn't an embedded system. It's a general purpose system. The hardware can be electronic, electrical, or electromechanical. Normally, embedded systems are classified into three major categories. The first one is microcontrollers. Here, you've got a CPU in addition to some RAM and ROM, along with some other peripherals and everything is embedded into a single chip and they carry out one specific task. A microprocessor is an integrated circuit which only has a CPU on the chip. There is no RAM, ROM or peripherals in this particular case. So basically a small CPU as we know it from the previous lesson. And finally we have systems on chips which is called an SOC. This may contain a microcontroller as one of its components and they almost always will include a CPU, memory, input output, ports, secondary storage on a single microchip. So this is an entire computer system which has been shrunken to operate on just one chipset. Now all of these are useful in embedded systems. So an embedded system includes both software and hardware. And you start with an analog or perhaps a digital input. Some kind of input is needed. There's a user interface, which is used to control the embedded system, which could be buttons or a screen. And there's some form of output. Now, embedded systems can contain all of those components, like sensors, mechanical components, microprocessors, actuators, and the software itself. And some of the latest embedded systems use very powerful quad-core or even octa-core CPUs and have a variety of input-output connections leading to a number of different applications. So they are blurring the boundary between what used to be a traditional embedded system always targeting a single task to a multi-purpose system in line with their modern computer. The final piece of the puzzle is the feedback-oriented systems. So there is some element of feedback that influences the use of an embedded system. So always include that in your answer as well. So what are some examples of embedded systems? Well, in the home, you'll have ovens, microwaves. Outside, you'll have car engines, lifts, and so on. So any type of electronic device which we can program or control normally has an embedded system built in. Now, embedded systems don't always need to be programmable. Sometimes they can be non-programmable. That means you just simply use it and you don't change the program all the time. Non-programmable devices needs to be replaced. For example, if there's a software upgrade, we can't change their program, therefore we buy a new one. Programmable devices permit upgrading, and this upgrading normally happens via two methods. One is to connect the device to a computer and download the update yourself, or you could use automatic updates via Wi-Fi, satellite, or a mobile phone connection, and chances are that the update is directly downloaded to your device without going through a computer and the cable. Embedded systems, like everything else, have advantages and disadvantages, and some of the benefits are that they're small in size and therefore easy to fit into devices. Compared to other systems, they're relatively low cost to make because we're not making really big computer systems like graphic cards and sound cards. We don't need something fancy, we just have, need something functional. They're usually dedicated to one task, allowing simple interfaces and offer no requirement for an operating system. They consume very little power, they can be controlled remotely using a phone, for example, and they can respond very quickly to changing input in real time. And they are feedback oriented, as we just said. And you can use mass prediction techniques. And with that, they're often very reliable. Now, of course, they have certain drawbacks as well. For example, they can be difficult to upgrade, especially if you want to make use of the latest technology, you will need to just replace the device. Troubleshooting also becomes tricky because they are embedded systems. So you need a specialist or an expert. Think about if your fridge malfunctions, you probably need to call in an engineer. You won't be able to fix it yourself. Although the interface can appear to be more simple, in reality it can be more confusing because the buttons might operate differently than traditional computers. Think about how many people use all the functions on their microwave. Often they get confused and just use the timer and the power button. Apart from that, nothing else is used. 
any device that can be accessed over the internet is also open to hackers and viruses so updates can be a bit tricky to handle and due to the difficulty in upgrading and fault finding devices are often just thrown away that means they create a lot of e-waste so make sure you know a few benefits and a few disadvantages of embedded systems so embedded systems can be of any type an autonomous car will have a number of embedded systems one that controls the in-car entertainment system perhaps another one for the gps system one for the airbags, one for the fuel injection system if it has it, or managing the electric battery, one for braking, one for vehicle security, one for exhaust emissions if it's a petrol engine, or traction control which prevents skidding. So a number of embedded systems might be part of a bigger device. Now on screen you have a media controller, something like Apple TV perhaps. It will have a front end which will probably allow you to plug in your aerial, maybe other cables, maybe satellite, maybe a fiber cable. It will have that set-top box controller which will have probably an SSD in there if you wanted to record video or shows. And it'll have a front panel as well where the remote signal or the manual input via buttons might be entered. It'll have some RAM and it'll have a user interface which will allow you to interact via an HDMI output and an analog audio output, for example, if you want to plug in your own speakers. And perhaps there's some software as well which allows the user to interact with it. Now in the case of a smart house, there could be a number of different systems that could also have embedded systems inside them. The one on screen is the security system, which will have maybe sensor inputs like temperature, pressure, sound or acoustic, an SSD and RAM to store things, to operate and record things, a keyboard or keypad interface, and perhaps some kind of output, which could be either an alarm or it could be an alert, or perhaps it just sends a notification to your device. Now here's a vending machine, that could be another example of an embedded system. You could have an input device such as a touchscreen or a keypad. It would have sensors showing position of the various different gates where the objects are, coin counters, there would be temperature sensors for example. There might be a wireless modem to send data back to the operator. There might be a display showing prices, change, selection choices, etc. Actuators might control the motors that dispense the items maybe operate the pumps that keep the vending machine cool or hot or whatever. And there might be tilting sensors to make sure the machine isn't being tampered with because somebody might want to shake it to drop those objects down. Perhaps they could also have an alarm as well. So a number of different types of input and output devices will be part of an embedded system, including the microcontroller, which controls everything. Now, there are so many embedded systems in the world, you won't be able to cover all of them in one particular lesson. So all you need to realize is that going back to the definition an embedded system will be designed for a specific task and if you're asked to explain how it works you need to take into account input some kind of processing and an output along with a feedback loop okay so you can pick anything in the home anything on screen your game console you can pick up a smart TV a smart lighting system there would be some kind of input some kind of processing some kind of output some kind of comparison to some pre-existing condition or preset data. Either the microprocessor does nothing or it sends signals to the actuator to do something. And then there will be a feedback loop that repeats the process until stop. So make sure you follow input, process, comparison, output, feedback elements to get the maximum amount of marks in any type of exam questions, which ask you to explain how an embedded system would apply to a particular scenario. Okay, that's enough on embedded systems. Hopefully you know enough now to answer the following questions. A car is fitted with the latest GPS navigation system. The device is controlled by an embedded system in the form of a microcontroller. Part A, describe the inputs needed by the embedded system and describe which outputs you would expect it to produce. Part B, since updates to the GPS are required every six months, explain how the device could be updated without the need to take the car to the garage or the manufacturer. You should also be able to list two benefits and two drawbacks of an embedded system. And you should also be able to explain what the difference is between microcontrollers, microprocessors, and system on chips. That's all for this particular lesson. If you found anything difficult, feel free to get back to me. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.